Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Ari Greenspan. Um, I live uh, just outside of Jerusalem, and this is the first of a number of relatively short videos to prepare you for the uh, e uh, exam and the practice of shrita that hopefully we'll be providing. Um, first of all, when we talk about shrita of an animal, we're referring to um, slaughtering an animal for kosher, kosher food. And um, we want to do this in the least painful way to the animal as possible. We will be using a special knife, which we'll be talking about. And there are many, many, many laws um, around the laws of Shrita and a lot of Jewish tradition. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge and uh, information that you have to have and experience in order to do it properly. Um, so what I thought we'd do is I thought we would go through the laws of Shrita using the uh, Shulchan Aruch, uh, the Code of Jewish Law, as our guide. And uh, we'll start there. First of all, who can be a Shochet? A Shochet can be any person, man or woman, even though the custom developed in uh, recent centuries that it shouldn't be a woman. Um, and the reason was that evidently women tended to faint when uh, when they saw the blood and there was a concern, not about the fainting, but because since one of the prohibitions, one of the things that makes a shrita invalid is if there's a hesitation while you're actually doing the, the movement of the shrita, of the slaughter with the knife, if a person were to faint, so therefore that shrita would be invalid. So therefore the custom developed the woman shouldn't, uh, do shrita. The truth is that the same law applies to a man who would be drunk or a man who uh, who would be uh, lighthearted and would be uh, fainting at the sight of blood as well. The tradition is that a person receives an oral kabbalah or, or an oral uh, how, how should we say, or, or a written document that says that he is a shrita, he is a shochet rather, um, and in the days of old, uh, that was sufficient to uh, allow a person to become a shochet. Um, today we assume that if you have a document that says that you're a shochet, you are a shochet, um, and um, and therefore you don't necessarily have to be tested. But what you have to understand is that it's a tremendous uh, obligation and a lot of weight hangs on your shoulders because if you happen to call yourself a shochet and you do shrita improperly, not only are you causing people to transgress a very significant and serious um, um, transgression, uh, prohibition in the Torah, but uh, in addition, you're causing people to make their, their pots and pans not kosher. In addition, you're causing people to make blessings with God's name um, over things that may not necessarily be able to be blessed and so on. So as a result, it is something you have to take very seriously. And um, I take it really seriously when I talk about who the people are that might even be considered to be possible to be a uh, shochtim. And as a result, uh, the laws of shrita have to be studied and the uh, test is uh, given and it's a very uh, rigorous test and the laws have to be reviewed from time to time. Um, when, I, when I learned many years ago, um, we, we went according to one of the um, rabbis who comments on the, uh, on the Code of Jewish Law, the Beragola, who says that for the first month that, uh, that you, after you've received your your uh, permission to slaughter, you um, have to review all of the 30 chapters of the laws of Shrita uh, once a day. 30 chapters once a day. And then for the first year, you have to review it once a month. And then for the rest of your life, you review it once a year. And as a result, all of these many laws, uh, at least in my mind, have uh, many of them are, you know, memorized, if not all of them are memorized. In fact, the, the, the Shulchan Aruch says you don't have to know every single detail. You don't have to remember every single detail, but you have to know enough to say, ah, there might be a problem here. And as a result, I have to go check this up or I have to check with my teacher on if this issue is forbidden. So that's a lot of knowledge. You have to know enough to know that maybe there's some sort of a problem here. Um, so as a result, we're gonna be going through these laws very seriously and um, we shall continue. Um, a person who is uh, Jewish, but we know that he does not know the laws of Shrita. If you hand him a knife 
that has been properly prepared and the knife is, we would call it a kosher knife, meaning that the knife is uh, perfectly smooth and we've checked it to make sure there are no nicks or any, no problems in it. So that person is allowed to slaughter an animal as long as you're standing there watching him to make sure that he does it properly. In other words, the, the process of slaughtering an animal by itself is not a religious project process. It has to just be done by a Jewish person. And if the person actually doing the process himself doesn't know the laws of Shrita, as long as he did it properly and a person who does know the laws of Shrita observes it, uh, it would be a kosher Shrita. Um, so, for example, a blind person is allowed to be a shochet, but obviously a blind person can't shech by himself because there's no way that anybody would know whether he slaughtered the animal uh, properly or he certain wouldn't. But if a blind person was slaughtering the animal and you were standing there watching him, it would per be perfectly okay. Um, a person has to uh, be, be normal, meaning you can't be some sort of a uh, person with psychological diseases and uh, acting in strange way. Um, a person who can't, um, a person who can't um, keep his hand still, meaning you, you have a shake in your hand or something like that, should not be a shochet. Of course, if a person is drunk, he's also not allowed to be a shochet uh, because you cannot control your hands uh, when you're when you're drunk. Um, if you do the process of shrita, the process of slaughtering. Uh, and you have in mind that you're doing it for some sort of an idol worship or some sort of a thing like this, of course, it is uh, not a kosher shrita. One thing that's important and that actually might uh, be something that uh, could happen in Africa, if you're slaughtering, let's say, in a building, but there's no floor, it's a dirt floor, right? Or you're slaughtering outside and it's dirt for that matter. You're not allowed to make a groove, you know, in the in the dirt so that the blood flows uh, away because evidently doing this process evidently was something that was done in the in ancient times and um, and was uh, was a process that somehow was used in, in um, uh, idol worship so therefore the rabbis say we're not allowed to do uh, anything along those lines um, and as a result the rabbis now look at um, what sort of Jews, we said, are allowed to be a shochet. Anybody who's allowed to be a shochet is if he's um, a practicing and religious and God-fearing Jew. But every Jew sins. So what happens if this person is a sinner? Let's say for argument's sake, um, I don't know, uh, the person happens to, uh, to hate putting on tefillin, okay? Or something along those lines. And as a result, he doesn't do it. But he doesn't do it because he doesn't believe in principle that God is there and God is the one that's commanding us and, and, and that he has an obligation to do it. Just it's hard for him to do. So therefore, he doesn't do it. That person is still allowed to become a shochet because everybody, everybody sins. There's no such thing as a person that didn't sin. Moshe Rabbeinu sinned. So as a result, that sort of a person is still allowed to be a shochet. However, if a person, let's say, has the same approach to something like keeping kosher, meaning a person knows and sort of believes that you should keep kosher or that you shouldn't eat meat and milk together, but what can you do? He loves a cheeseburger too much, and it's hard for him to control himself. That person is not allowed to be a shochet. Why? Because as soon as it comes to the issue of eating kosher and keeping kosher, and if that's an area that you have difficulty with, uh, it's uh, something that is a slippery slope and it'd be very easy for you, therefore, to say, you know, okay, that shrita was really done not so well, but you know what, let's let it slip. It'll be okay. We'll call it a kosher animal. Uh, so anything like that. So that's called a mumar le teavon. Teavon means appetite, meaning I have an appetite to do this thing. Let's think of another example. Um, um, let me think of a mitzvah. For example, uh, it's hard for you to sit in a sukkah or you have an appetite to wear wool and linen together. You happen to love the way wool and linen fits together. Again, you're not saying that it's permissible and you're not saying that the Bible doesn't uh, prohibit it and you're not saying that God is not the author of the Bible, but you're just saying there's a prohibition of wearing wool and linen sewn into the same garment, but rather... 
I just happen to love the way that looks or love the way that feels. And even though I don't really want to do it, I sort of can't control myself and I go ahead and do it. Um, so that person would be allowed to slaughter a kosher animal, assuming he knows the laws and assuming he keeps all the other mitzvahs in the Torah. Um, but like we said, if you have that same problem when it comes to kosher food, that's not considered to be uh, something that is, uh, is, that is okay. Um, what happens if you're what the Talmud calls a mumer lahachis? You're doing it on purpose, meaning you know for a fact that it's forbidden to do. Um, and uh, you're saying, I don't care. I don't care that I don't really care that it, it it's forbidden to wear wool and linen. I don't really have a need to wear wool and linen. I don't particularly like it, but rather uh, you say, um, but I don't care. I don't care that God gave it as a mitzvah. I don't believe in it, and therefore I'm not going to do it. So that's what Chazal say is a mumar ledavar echad, and a mumar ledavar echad um, is allowed to um, is is allowed to shecht if somebody is keeping an eye on him. Um, but um, if you happen to be a mumar ledavar echad, you you doing this because you disagree with it and because you purposely want to go against the Torah, um, particularly when it comes to avodah zarah or when it which is uh, idol worship or when it comes particularly to Shabbat. Um, if you do not keep the Shabbat one hundred percent and you say. I don't care that God gave it and I don't want to keep the Shabbat. I don't care about all the other mitzvot. I'll do them. But when it comes to Shabbat, I'm not going to keep the Shabbat. Um, in the eyes of the rabbis, that makes you equal to an idol worshiper, or equal to a non-Jew. And therefore, um, if a person is not very careful about keeping the Shabbat, or if a person believes in a, or practices idol worship and so on, that person is not allowed um, to um, that person is not allowed to uh, uh, to be a shochet. Now, this is very important because if you're a person who's not careful about these issues, um, you know you're really not supposed to be doing this shrita, and uh, your meat would not be considered kosher. And as a result, um, it's something that you have to be careful of. There's a there's a philosophical and a religious component to being a shochet. And if you're not ready to make uh, those, um, I wouldn't call them, um, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm pausing here with my English. Um, if, uh, if you wouldn't, um, not willing to make those choices in your life to really keep the mitzvot and keep Shabbat, you're not the right person uh, to, um, to be a shochet uh, for your family. Um, Shechita doesn't require a particular uh, frame of mind. It doesn't require what we would call kavana, meaning <clears throat> um, when you blow a shofar and you want the shofar to um, the people who listen to you to uh, fulfill the mitzvah of the shofar, you have to have in mind that you're doing this as a mitzvah and you're doing the shofar blowing and that people will be allowed to um, fulfill their mitzvah when they hear you blow the shofar. However, when it comes to shechita, there's no such thing, there's no such obligation. You make a blessing beforehand, but if you, if you happen to be holding a knife and you forgot to make the blessing and, and a bird flew into your hand and uh, without realizing it, you sort of crossed your hands and you happen to do a proper kosher shechita, it's good. Or another example that the Talmud gives, if you're, if you're hunting, let's say, Okay, hard to imagine. You're hunting with a bow and arrow, but instead of an arrow, you've got an arrow that's got a perfectly smooth knife on it that's 100% permissible to use for shrita. And you, you take this bow and arrow and you shoot at the bird in the sky and you're not even really expecting uh, the bird in the sky to uh, be even near your, your, your knife. And you happen to do a perfect shrit, and it's, you see that it's perfectly kosher, something that's sort of a little bit, uh, you know, would sound to be something very rare. It would be considered to be kosher, okay? What's not for permissible is if um, you're watching your knife and, uh, and uh, you're, it's not in your hand and you're doing no action whatsoever, uh, but rather the knife is on a wheel and the wheel is turning automatically, let's say. It's got an electric motor in it or it's got an electric motor going like this and uh, a bird it comes over and happens to stick his neck out. So that is insufficient. That's not properly kosher.
Okay, so that's it for our first 15-minute uh, uh, segment, and we shall continue. And uh, I wish everybody a good day, and it's Erev Shabbat here, so I wish you a Shabbat Shalom. And we'll continue with more of the laws of Shrita um, in uh, part two.